Jones. Army aircraft plays an essential role on today's battlefield in close support of our fighting men. But aircraft is, of course, vulnerable to enemy ground fire. Aircraft is, of course, vulnerable to enemy ground fire. To enemy ground fire. I was in the hospital six months. He was in 13. So just that second and a half was about seven or eight months in the hospital. So that's how close we were to not making it. If there's a hell, it was, that, was, that was 45 minutes of hell right there. This and other stories on today's program of Your Army Report. You might be wondering, how do we recreate these missions with such detail? And the answer is simple, using the sponsor of this video, War Thunder. But instead of me telling you about them, I'm going to let the star of this story tell you himself, F-4 Phantom Pilot Carl Parlator. I've been, been on War Thunder for, oh, I don't know, five or five and a half years straight. Uh, every day I get on the game and I play it and I thoroughly enjoy it. I just don't know how they do it. The graphics are incredible. I hate to say it, but I'm an arcade kind of guy. I'll get on the computer late at night after dinner and it just makes me feel really good. And it, it, I live my youth vicariously through War Thunder. So if you want to join Carl and 70 million other players in the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made, use the link below and download War Thunder, totally free. It's available on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox, and right now, all new players can get a massive bonus pack using my link below. So don't wait. Take command of more than 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships for more than 10 different nations. And if you're lucky, you might even end up dogfighting against Carl yourself. Use the link below and come join us today. Thanks again to War Thunder, and now, enjoy. As far back as I can remember, I've always wanted to fly. I have no reason, I have no idea why I wanted to do that, but I wanted to fly. I got my pilot's license when I was 17. The interesting part about that was that I lived in Nassau County and you couldn't get your driver's license until you were 18. So my mom had to drive me to the airport so I could go fly. So I couldn't drive a car, but I could fly an airplane. But Carl wasn't satisfied with civilian aircraft. He wanted to go faster and feel the thrill of aerial combat. I wanted to fly fighters. And the only way I could do that was by joining the military. So I said, okay, I'll join the military. But that was my dream is always fly fighters. With the United States recently entering the conflict in Vietnam, this meant that his timing would be perfect to join the fray. And here, he would be assigned to his dream aircraft, the premier fighter jet of the U.S. Armed Forces, the F-4 Phantom. My first impressions of the F-4 was, wow, that is a big airplane. Can this thing actually fly? And it had those two big J-79, uh, I think dash 17s back there that put out 19,000 pounds of thrust and full burner. And she could get up and go. And um, it was a magnificent airplane. And I was totally enthralled with being able to fly in the airplane. The training was, was incredible. We had a good year and a half of training before we went to combat. <clears throat> we had survival training, we had jungle training, we had sea survival. <clears throat> we had, because I was in the back seat, I had the radar, which I had to control. So we had an intensive six week course in radar uh, training. And then we had six months of flying the F-4. After about a year and a half of training, which was quite intense, I was assigned to go to Vietnam to uh, Cameron Bay and be assigned to the uh, 391st TAC Fighter Squadron, where I flew F-4s in combat for the first time. Fortunately though, Carl and the other new pilots were not thrown straight to the wolves, at least not yet. The, the first missions were uh, easy missions and um, what we had a term that was TIC troops in contact. But the first couple of missions were, were TIC's trees in contact, which would go on, they were milk runs really, you know, knock down some trees and just to make sure that you had a feel for what was going on. So the really the, the really the heady missions, the really tough ones, didn't occur until you had about 
five or six missions under your belt where you felt that you knew the systems, you knew pretty much the local procedures, what they expected of you, and how to handle it. Now, it is important to note here that when Carl was assigned to Vietnam during his first tour, he would not be the front seat pilot, but the back seater, in charge of the radar, radio, and other tasks. Yeah, the front seat and back seat set up in the F-4 was primarily the front seater was flying the airplanes. He, was, he we had the control stick, although I had one in the back with throttles. Uh, but he was able, he was a commander. You know, he was the last word. He, we did what he did. Uh, he flew the airplane. He uh, was the one who uh, had the uh, weapons controls and all that stuff. My job primarily in the back seat was control the radar, work the radios, so I took as much burden off him as I possibly could so he could concentrate on flying the airplane in combat, which took an incredible amount of intensity and focus. And anything I could take off his shoulders made his job a lot easier, which kept him alive and also kept me alive. So that's what I did in the back seat. And also, I also looked around to make sure that, uh, you know, if there's somebody was shooting at us, I could see it, and, and a number of times I was able to see stuff coming at us that the front seat wasn't aware of simply because he was concentrating out here and I was looking over my uh, 9-3 to make sure that something wasn't coming up and trying to nip us. As Carl began his tour, he was expectedly nervous, but he soon realized that he was not in the thick of things just yet and would be able to get comfortable as a combat pilot. One of the first missions I had was uh, we, uh, I was in the back seat and the first couple of missions it's kind of like they're, they don't throw you right into the briar's patch. You get out and take a kind of like a, a tree busting exercise or something like that. And, uh, one mission was to go up to North Vietnam and I was, you know, that's going to be a tough one. So we went up there into Root Pack 1 which was the southern part of North Vietnam. And I was looking over my shoulder to see if there were SAM AAA MiGs or anything like that. None of that showed up. Then I looked down and there was an OV-10 down there. And he was doing fact work and very low. And I said, it can't be all that bad because this guy's down there and in the weeds and I'm up here in this fighter doing 400 knots. So uh, that was the first like recollection of combat. As he and the rest of his squadron began to put missions under their belts and prove themselves as formidable combat pilots, the mission style began to shift. Much of what they would be doing in the near future was low-level support, dropping ordnance on pinpoint military targets in support of American troops on the ground. Most of the stuff was uh, 30 degree dive bomb where you'd, you'd come in at a 30 degree angle, drop it off at 1500 feet and pull out. And then we had the low stuff, which was when the, the guys on the ground really needed support, you would have high drags, napalm, rockets, where you would get down to uh, 500 feet, 450 knots, 500 knots sometimes, if it was pretty hot. And then you could really, I mean, you could put a Mark, a Mark 82 high drag, which is a, a 500 pound bomb with these big metal fins that come out on the back and they would almost stop and come straight down and you could put it right into a, almost a bucket. They were so accurate. But you'd have to get down in the weeds to do it. And that's where the bad guys could really uh, make your day, uh, let's say, put a, put a bad spin on your day. One of the first missions that Carl remembers in this style was with a seasoned front seater. And it was a baptism by fire that set a key role model for the young Carl Parlator. The first mission that I had, I was flying with a guy by the name of uh, Harley Hughes. At the time he was a major, but he retired as a three-star. Probably one of the better pilots I ever flew with. We were scrambled off the alert pad, we were on alert. And we went out and uh, this particular target that I was flying with, with uh, uh, Harley at the time, was uh, quad 50s in a valley. And we had high drags on, I couldn't imagine my gosh, this is going to be really intense. And Harley was cool and calm, and I was a little nervous because I'm sitting there, you know, he's flying the airplane, so he's got it controlling, and he knows what he's doing. I'm sitting there just, you know, three feet behind him. And we roll in, and there's lead flying all over the place. There was some of the stuff that, you know, the humidity in the air was so thick that sometimes if the stuff came close, you could see something streaking by the canopy. 
Well, he took out the guns, we came back, and I'll tell you what, I was just, wow. If I ever get to the front seat, I want to fly like this guy. We landed and we debriefed and that was, that was the mission. As Carl continued his tour, he went on many missions just like this, learning the ropes and dropping napalm and drag bombs onto North Vietnamese targets across the jungle-covered countryside. But from the air, it was sometimes difficult to see just how much this support really meant to the soldiers below. There was a time when there was this young, we call them grunts, I love the grunts. Those are the guys that carry rifles and they saw the really ugly part of the war. They would come to Cameron Bay for R&R. &R. That's how safe the place was. And this one kid, he couldn't have been, and I didn't see this, but somebody told me this. He must have been, he wasn't 20 years old, and he was disheveled, his uniform was dirty, and he asked to go out on the flight line. Okay, we'll take you out and see you and show you an F-4. And the way I was told is that this young man, he, you could see he was looking for something special. And he walked the flight line then for, and then saw an airplane that had a name on it. And he went over and hugged the airplane. And they asked him why he did that was because that he was in really serious trouble. And this one airplane came in and came in so low to take out the bad guys that he could actually read the name on the airplane. I, I found that a very touching story. By this time in late 1968, Carl was a seasoned pilot. He had more than 50 combat missions under his belt and knew the ins and outs of flying low-level support missions over Vietnam. But no amount of combat experience could have prepared him for the events that would take place on September 3rd of 1968. I was flying with Major Tom Asselone, who was my assigned uh, AC aircraft commander. And we were on alert, and um, we were Boxer 5 and 6. Now, Boxer 1 and 2 had been scrambled that morning, because we'd go on, I think, from 8 to 6 o'clock or something like that. And they got scrambled right off the bat. They took off, went to this particular, uh, in three corps, a special forces camp named Ken Yan. And the, the, the special forces camp was under siege. And the C-7s, we called them caribous, would come in and they would get the living heck shot out of them. And they couldn't resupply these guys. So there was this gunner who was really good. And Boxer 1 and 2 came in and took a round through the canopy. <laughs> so when he came back, he was white as a sheet and said, this guy's pretty good. So we got scrambled later in the afternoon to go back to the same target. And I'm telling Tom, this guy is the gunner. We need to really be careful. We take off, takes us about 20 minutes to get down there from where Cameron was. We orbit, the, the uh, fact says, okay guys, we got the special forces camp on one side, we got a tree line on the other, and I, I have to restrict your running heading because I don't want you flying over the good guys. So we're gonna drop hydra eggs on a gun on a restricted running heading dropping it at a low altitude, I'm sitting back there and saying, I don't, this, this doesn't sound real good to me. And number two had napalm and a gun. We had hydregs. And I said, I told my front seat, I said, let's see if the faculty let us drop the uh, number two first, so the, drop the napalm, put fire. We didn't know where the gun was. We had a general idea, but we didn't know where it was. We dropped the napalm, we could put smoke in, and we could hide behind the smoke, and then we would be able to get this guy. He said, no, the, in fact, wants, uh, wants us to come in first to blow the trees away so we could see. Oh, okay, you know, yes, sir. Well, we had just rolled in and we were on our first pass. <clears throat> the FAC had told us to restrict our run and heading between this tree line and the, the special forces camp. As we rolled in, I'm concentrating on uh, the altitudes, calling off altitudes for the front seater and telling him when to pull or this is just kind of a back of information to give him an idea of when he really had to get rid of the bomb before he hit the ground so he doesn't, he doesn't crash. So as we, re you, could, boom, boom, you could feel those bombs coming off the airplane. He started about a four or five G pull up and at that point, boom, the airplane takes a hit. And the first thing in your mind is, what's that? Well, you know what that was. <laughs> and the airplane immediately goes into a violent roll. And I could tell it was rolling because the sun was here and 
as the airplane rolls, you get bright light in the cockpit, and then you don't get any light at all. So it's, it's shadow, and then sun, shadow, sun, shadow. And I'm throwing forward, because the airplane's doing one of these pitches, and the sand, uh, we were at Cameron Bay, and there was a lot of sand there. Now, our maintenance tr troops were really good, but they could keep all the sand out of the airplane. So the sand just hit me in the face, so we had some negative Gs on it at that time. And somewhere in here, Tom screaming, eject, 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 and boom. So I go down for my handle, and I look up, and the canopy goes, and boom, out I go, without even me touching the handle. Why? Because on the F4, when the front seater pulled the ejection handle, you go first. You always go first. Why? Well, because if he goes first and then you go, there's going to be a collision. Also, he's got rocket motors on the back, on the bottom of the seat. If he goes on the top of you, he's going to fry you. So the back seater always went first. So when he pulled the handle, boom, out I went. I was just about, because I'm left-handed, I'm going to read for the handle with my left hand, although they say you're supposed to do it with your right hand. I'm left. So I grab down here, boom, out I go. Canopy goes, here I go. Boom, my helmet blows off. My gloves blow off. I had a great watch, a glycine airman special with my name on it. Boom, it comes off. It's probably in somebody's safe right now as a war moment because it had my name on it. The, the slipstream takes my arm, wraps it around the chair, breaks my arm, now it's dislocated. I get out, I'm tumbling, boom, the chute opens up, boom, boom, into I go into the trees. I'm, what the heck is going on? And as I came through the trees, I, the branches just cut the living heck out of my face. In a time frame of less than 30 seconds, Carl Parlator and Tom Asselone have gone from a low-level attack run to ejecting and touching down in hostile territory. Their F-4 Phantom, right at the moment of pulling up from their attacking dive, was struck by an enemy anti-aircraft round. Immediately, their F-4 went into a spin, and miraculously, in mere seconds, both pilots were able to eject before their aircraft struck the ground and exploded. But now injured, alone, and surrounded by the enemy, their fight was far from over. So I wind up in this tree, which is a pretty big tree. It's one of those Vietnamese trees that maybe are 100 feet tall or something like that. As luck would have it, the dear Lord didn't want me to die that day. I had landed on the edge of this, this crater that had been made by a 2,000 pound bomb. Had to be a big gun because it was a huge crater. And I'm hanging on the top of this tree from my, and shoot, I got my arm is all busted up. My leg is a little screwed up because it hit the tree. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, whoa, man, what's going on? You know, because it just happened, boom, 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 that quick. And here, boom, 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 boom. There's noise stuff going on. I'm sweating, there's blood in my face. It's, I'm not very happy, I'm not a happy camper at this point. And then all of a sudden I hear, is that and there's this little branch get shot off <laughs> and a crazy thing and this little leaf goes choo, 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 choo. falling leaf right next to me some guy across the shade he had an AK and he was popping at me now I don't know was he trying to scare me or not but if he was trying to scare me he didn't have to because I was already scared and he shoots his branch away and and I don't he would maybe he was trying to get me to sucker some other guys in so I couldn't move this arm, so I had ARC-10 radios. They're the emergency radios. So I get the uh, one, I had two of them, one here and one here. I pulled this one out, I said, you know, this is Boxer 5, Bravo, Bravo, the back seater, Alpha, the front seater. I'm hurt, I'm in a tree, I need some help. I never knew I made that call because I don't remember it. <laughs> The, the, our wingman heard me distinctly say that on the radio. I, till this day, I don't remember making a call. So I wait a little bit, and here I and here comes a Huey, a UH-1 Army, God bless those guys. And he comes in, and he lands in the crater. And he's... Now, in a crater, there's stuff, there's, and it's blown around, dirt in my face. And so these two gunners come running out. We'll get you out, we'll get you out. Okay, get yeah. yeah. So they run up and they try to get me out of the tree, but they can't because the coke releases, they, they call coke release on the, on the uh, harness that's holding me up. They, they don't know how to operate it. I'm, you know, I'm, I can't help it because my shoulder's like this. 
So I said, okay, we'll do it. So he puts a, he puts a, a belt around my leg <laughs> and cuts the rises. So I go, whack! <laughs> and I fall down. Now I'm hanging upside down and my legs all, it's torn up pretty good. And I'm, I guess I'm using some really flowery language. <laughs> this guy says, get me out of this because it really hurts. <laughs> so he says, okay. So he takes his knife, goes, cuts the belt, and boom, I fall about eight feet onto the back of my head. I get another dueling scar back here. <laughs> so I could care less. I just want to get the heck out of this thing. So they grab me by the back of the neck, drag me across the floor of this crater to the chopper, just as they're about to throw me into this Yui. Boom, he gets hit. So he falls off, and I, and I have a picture of this too, by the way. Some HH-53 out of Benoit came up and took a picture after I had been rescued. So I've, I still have that picture. The Yui falls off to the, to, the, to the right. Now, if he had fallen off to the left, I wouldn't be here today because he would be landing right on top of me because I was sitting there right. They were about to throw me into the Yui. He crashes, and all hell breaks loose. Their lead's flying back and forth. So the... The co-pilot of this Huey guy by the name of Ian Dawson, I found this guy after 40 years. He comes out, he's got his AK-47 in his hands. He comes out of the crater and he drags the muzzle of the AK across my face. I talked to this guy 40 years after this happened. He said he still felt bad about doing that. Because what I did is I took the muzzle and kind of pushed it away. I told, I told Ian, I said, don't, don't feel bad about it. I don't remember if that ever happening. So after another couple of minutes go by, here comes a loach and HH-58 comes in and he comes in like he was on a Sunday flight. He could care less. And this guy was, he had no brains and he had a real set of nads. He comes in, lands. They take me because I'm the guy that's hurt the worst. They take me and they put me in the back of the chopper. Now, a, a, a loach has got this little part in the front where the pilot and the co-pilot sit. Then there's the transom that runs up to the uh, the helicopter blades where the engine is, and then they've just got the space back here. Well, they take me and they throw me back there because they're afraid I'm going to fall out of the helicopter. Ian Dawson gets in there with me, holds me, so I don't fall out, and we take off and head back towards Tainan, the 45th Surgical, which was the nearest hospital. I can still remember, this I remember, my head was on the floor of the helicopter, and I could see the trees go flying by. It's crazy what you can what you remember. Fortunately for Carl, after finding himself injured and hanging from a tree, help arrived in the form of an Army Huey helicopter. However, this rescue would not go as planned. After cutting down Carl and then nearly loading him onto the Huey, again the chopper took a direct hit from enemy fire, rolling over into a crash. At this point, both Carl and his rescuers were now in need of rescue. But luckily, the U.S. Army and Air Force answered their distress call and immediately began pouring firepower onto every enemy position in the area, suppressing their fire so that a second rescue attempt could be made. This would come shortly thereafter in the form of a small loach heli. And thankfully, this one would be a success. But once again, Carl was still critically injured and in major need of medical attention. We get to the 45th surgical, and I'm busted up pretty good. Uh, there was one orthopedic specialist on duty that day, or in, in three court, and he was on leave. But because he had nothing to do, he decided to come to work. Thank God he did, because he comes in, they say, hey, this, this lieutenant's really busted up bad. He looks at my leg, my, my right leg, and it's, it's bent, the foot's bent that way. So he feels for a pulse in the bottom of my foot and he couldn't get one. He said, look, I'm, the, I'm 23 years old at the time. Two hours before I was in perfect health. Now I'm pretty well busted up. He says, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to set your leg and if I get a pulse, it'll be okay. But if I don't, I'm gonna have to take your leg. That's not good information you wanna hear. He said, but I don't have time to give you anesthesia. I'm gonna have to set it. Okay. So he grabs it, pops it back in. That did not feel good. And then my shoulder was all screwed up. And he says, okay, I'll put you out. And I'm going to sit in the shoulder. I wake up in, in a MASH unit. As God is my witness, I can still close my eyes and see that. I wake up and I, you know, before you uh, wake up in the morning and you're uh, a little drowsy and, and, you know, but you're still 
cognizant, but you know you're asleep. And I, and I said to myself, and I still remember this to this day, Carl, you're dead. I said, I have no idea why I said that, because I had no recollection of what went on. My mind had just shut down. So I wake up, and it's, I'm in a room like in it's Dante's Inferno. There's these 23-year-old, uh, excuse me, I'm the 23. There's these 17, 18-year-old kids that are all busted up. Found out later they were in an APC. They got a mind blown out underneath them. They were just chopped up. And there was blood, and they're moaning. And, and I look around, and there's this guy next to me that looks very familiar. I'm, who the hell? I realize that's Tom Aslone. And these are my exact words, because I remember distinctly what I said. I said, Tom, what are you doing here? And he looks at me. He said, what am I doing here? Look at yourself. And then I realized what had happened to me. Holy mackerel. Man, that I did an inventory of all my parts to see if I was still in one piece. Thank God I was. Except for a couple of broken bones, dislocated shoulders, stuff like that. So then the doc comes in. He says, uh, I want to take some more x-rays of you. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, fine. So these two young corpsmen come in. They're 17 and 18. I don't think they were... They, I don't even know if they shaved or not. They, they came in, they put me on, the, like I was porcelain. They put me on this gurney, they wheel me off to the x-ray room, they lay me on the x-ray table. Just then, vroom, vroom, we get rocketed. And these mass units are these big buildings that are canvassed with air bladders to keep it a support. There's shrapnel coming through the top of this thing. So these two kids, and I mean kids, they take me off the gurney, they lay me on the ground, one guy lays down over the top of me, covers his, my chest with his body. The other guy lays down and covers my legs with his body during the whole attack. They were sacrificing their bodies to save me. I will never forget that as long as I live. Eventually, Carl Parlator made a full recovery and after a short time home, had his mind fully made up that he was going back to once again fly F-4 Phantoms over Vietnam. She comes right over and looks me in the eye and she says, Carl, you're going back? I said, Ma, you know the answer to that. Of course I have to. She said, you do that, I'm gonna break your other leg. My father couldn't look at me. Then I recuperated and uh, then I went back and on flying status and I went for another couple of tours. I want to say this from the bottom of my heart, support TJ3 history and War Thunder. You're really going to enjoy it. Join Carl today and download War Thunder totally free at the link below. To help us save more stories like this one, please consider joining my Patreon at the link below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.